Oh, got it. Right. But the difference will tra transform like a matter field. <laughs> yep, yep. And he uh, did a, a lot of important work at the time in our understanding of uh, binary physics. And in recent years, they've been uh, working a lot on machine learning physics in this topic of his lecture. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, the topic of these lectures is going to be uh, modern machine learning for high energy physics. And uh, just a brief outline. Um, so today we're going to focus primarily on uh, motivations. and um, some basics. Then uh, lecture two, we're going to uh, talk about classification uh, with neural networks. Um, lecture three, Uh, generative modeling and density estimation. Uh, and finally, uh, lecture four, is going to be about uh, anomaly detection. So my goal in these lectures, uh, I'm going to assume that uh, most of you haven't, uh, I'm going to assume that, I'm not going to assume any prior knowledge, so I'm going to assume most of you haven't uh, seen this material before. And my goal is to take you through, give you an overview uh, or a taste of um, the sort of the, what I would consider the, the mainstream or the main uh, applications of machine learning to our field, uh, primarily LHC, but also uh, beyond. Um, uh, that stuff that's going on 
um, sort of the hot topics uh, of today. OK, and um, this is my attempt to compress. I've given a, a, a full semester course on this uh, at Rutgers. And I've also given uh, four two-hour long lectures um, uh, previously. So I'm trying to compress all this down now to uh, the TASI time. And uh, so this is going to be aspirational. Um, OK, so we'll see how it goes. Um, good. So just by way of introduction or motivation, let me, uh, Liantao already um, uh, uh, sort of hinted at it. But um, so I was a student here at TASI with very fond memories uh, in 2003. And the topic, um, so my own personal history, just by way of uh, give, giving you a bit of motivation, pers personal motivation. So in 2003, I was here as a student. Um, I, I think this, I don't remember the space. I don't know if this was renovated after that. But the topic then, I think, was. Uh, I think, I think, I'm 2001. I think it's because. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think We're it's, so old. Yeah, I think the classroom is, is, is over there. Right, the original. OK. Yeah, the yeah. The like there. So I think this was called Progress in String Theory. Um, and then I lectured here last in 2009. And what? Well, it was a phenomenology one. And um, I talked about dynamical su supersymmetry breaking. And now here we are in, gosh, it's 2022. And I'm going to tell you about ML for HEP. OK, so why am I going through all this? Um, just want to give you a feeling for where the field has been and you know what's happening. So in 2009, OK, forget about the string theory days. In 2009, <laughs> okay, in 2009, the LHC was just going to turn on. It was very exciting. Uh, we, we were for sure going to discover new physics in the first days of the LHC. Um, there was going to be a gluino at a TV that was just going to poke us in the eye. And you know, the experimentalists were going to do all the hard work of doing the searches. And there were going to be like no backgrounds. And then we would just be left with signal. And um, it would be up to us theorists to you know, come up with the, the model of the universe to fit to the signal, measure the Gluino mass, yada, yada. Um, so yeah, so that was in, uh, in 2009. We were all so sure that um, new physics was going to be discovered at the LHC immediately. Um, suffice to say, that did not uh, pan out uh, as planned. Um, and um, so yeah, safe to say this didn't turn out as expected. Um, oh, I can't. Raise this one. Okay. But so Susie, uh, extra dimensions was supposed to be right around the corner. Um, and uh, here we are in 2022, um, and we haven't found new physics yet. Um, and I think the, it's also safe to say that the same has happened for. Um, uh, TV scale WIMPs. And if you go back maybe one generation, um, you could say the same is true for guts um, and the, the prediction of proton decay that uh, still hasn't panned out. Um, OK, so um, in a nutshell, that's why I'm here to tell you about uh, machine learning for, for HEP. OK. <laughs> Good. So, um, but just to broaden on that point a little bit more, so I think we've looked for new physics in all the top down motivated places, myself included. So I spent uh, almost all those years between uh, then and now working on. Uh, supersymmetry and collider phenomenology of supersymmetry. So we've looked for new physics in all the top-down motivated places. So far, uh, nothing yet. And so I think your generation um, is facing this. Uh, it's a, and, and there are several different paths that 
uh, are being taken, I think. Right? So one of them, of course, is to do more model building, okay? Come up with more uh, well-motivated uh, places to look. Um, or model building to explain why there shouldn't be anything uh, at the LHC. That's another uh, form of model building. Okay, another path that people are taking, I think, um, is to come up with new experiments. Say that uh, our existing ones just completely are not looking in the right place, and so what we need are completely new experiments and new ways of looking for uh, new physics. So there's a lot of that uh, going on. And I guess uh, what I'm going to be uh, pushing uh, in my lectures is the third, third way is to get more out of existing data. Okay, that is to say we have so much uh, data, um, not just from LHC, but many other sources. Um, and with modern machine learning, we can do so much more things with that. Um, and so th that gives us hope that there's interesting things buried in there, uh, hiding in there, that uh, we would have otherwise missed. Okay, so this is the idea that what if new physics is hiding in the, in the existing data, but we haven't looked, looked in the right place. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, what I would call this is, you know, it's a different way of uh, working in our field, following the data, or data-driven theory. Okay, so for me, that's just personally, this is my main motivation. Um, I, I want to be, you know, I want to, my, my motivation has always been to um, discover new physics, and so for me, this is my main motivation for uh, caring or, or studying, working on uh, machine learning for, for high energy physics. Okay, um, one more motivation I can mention. Is there another board? No, okay. So, um, Good, so another motivation so yeah this is this is motivation one, I guess so another motivation I would say is for studying ml for hep is that ml is really cool uh. Okay, I'm gonna write that on the board. So ML is really cool. What I mean is that it's uh, really, really powerful. So it's, um, it's like we're in the Stone Age and someone from the future came and gave us a hammer. I mean, so, so it's like that. And um, so uh, you probably know, but sort of in the, in the 2010s and, to, and precursors in the 2000s, there was a revolution in deep learning. And of course, that's propagated to uh, our everyday lives in many different ways. Uh, we still don't have self-driving cars, but we do have Siri. Um, so yeah, so it's propagated uh, in many different ways. And, um, and so, you know, we have very powerful methods Uh, new methods uh, just waiting to be applied to the data that we care about. Uh, and I mean, these are really new things that, uh, so when you start studying this, you get the feeling, wow, this is a wide open frontier. I mean, we can be pioneers, that we can look at the data uh, and get things out of the data in qualitatively uh, new ways that we, we couldn't do before. Um, so it must be like, you know, when, I don't know, when you were in the, in the 
whatever the enlightenment and Newton invented calculus or something. Um, or, or you were, I don't know when statistics was invented, but when, when people first understood for the first time probability and statistics. So uh, that's, that's what I think it, it's, um, it's like. And um, yeah, so, so with these powerful new methods, as we'll see uh, in these lectures, you can um, achieve uh, near optimal, essentially optimal performance in existing analyses. So that's nice. We can do what we were doing before, but we can do it better. Okay? And um, perhaps uh, more interestingly, we can uh, do qualitatively uh, new types of analyses. And this will become especially um, apparent in the last lecture when we talk about anomaly detection and uh, model independent searches for new physics. OK, good. So um, right, so all of this sort of would, of course, be for nothing if we didn't have the data, right? And um, so that's the other thing, I guess. So the data. Is there? So we're in the definitely in a big data era, right? We of course have, I would I would say the granddaddy of them all, at the LHC, but we also have uh, Gaia data, we have LIGO data, pulsar timing array data, soon to be LSST data, and the list goes on. Uh, and this one, I guess, is closed to theorists, but these are all uh, open data sets, yeah? And there is a movement at LHC to have more and more open data. Um, so, so there's a lot of data for even uh, people like us uh, to play around with. Um, okay. So the last thing I'll say by way of motivation is that so although machine learning was developed primarily by uh, computer scientists for real world applications, uh, high energy physics, I think, is an ideal setting for ML. And you know the reason is that um, basically uh, we understand our data, we understand our data very well. So we understand the standard model, and we understand our experiments. Um, and because we understand uh, the standard model, um, our data is very clean. Um, and also, we have very accurate and relatively cheap simulations, at least at the LHC. So like MadGraph, Pythia. Okay, and with these accurate and cheap simulations, uh, we can do a lot more, I think, than people can do in other fields. Particularly, we can prototype uh, new methods. Again, something which you don't have to be an experimentalist to do. So, as a theorist, we can prototype uh, new methods, do a lot of proof of concept uh, development research. Uh, also, we can um, potentially understand uh, what the machine learned. So we can potentially interpret um, our black box AI uh, algorithms. OK, and indeed, um, I think it's been recognized for uh, many decades that this is a uh, our field is a good setting for machine learning. Um, our field has traditionally uh, been early adopters of all these techniques, neural networks, BDTs. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, 
um, experimentalists were applying neural networks already to measure the top mass or to do B tagging. So neural networks have had a long um, uh, history uh, in our field of doing useful things. Um, I think we kind of got behind. So, so we were early adopters and developers, we collectively. Um, but then this happened, and now we're, now we're playing, I guess, uh, catch up, which is an exciting opportunity, I think, for, for our field. OK, and so good. I think I've done a bit of motivation. And just maybe the last thing I'll say is that it's increasingly, you might say, well, the history I just gave is very much based on the experiments. Uh, and so indeed, this was traditionally the domain of experimentalists, but it, it's increasingly not just experimentalists, experimentalists. Uh, so I think us theorists have a role to play. They're so busy in all, all these meetings all the time. We, we don't have as many meetings. So uh, we have more time to think outside the box. Uh, we're not constrained by sort of what they did before. Um, so yeah, so we can do you know, proof of concept. We can analyze open data. And if you think this is not theoretical enough, uh, that's a fair point. But I think we're actually witnessing this. This is the most grandiose thing I'll say, and then I'll stop. I, I think we're witnessing. Uh, potentially a third category of physicists, uh, you know, being born uh, today. So neither uh, experimental, experimental, nor theorist, but somebody who works with the data, um, but is, it didn't necessarily build the experiment. So I don't know what you would call this. Maybe a data scientist. Or a dataist? I don't know. So, okay, so that's the propaganda to open this uh, set of lectures. Yes? Um, so, in this sort of post revolution era, um, are all of the techniques being used in high energy physics taken from other places, industry, and elsewhere? Uh, that's a good question. So, um, there's definitely a lot of that going on, um, which is, I, I think, a great opportunity. There's just things sitting on the shelves. So when you talk about low-hanging fruit, you know, having worked in supersymmetry for uh, several, for, for a while, uh, <laughs> it was very hard. Like all the good ideas were already taken. Like it was very hard to come up with anything new. Here, you could just almost anything you do is new, uh, and it, even even if the method was developed uh, previously, just applying it to our field is new. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. But then there's also increasingly uh, new techniques being developed, um, it, like intrinsic to our field. Uh, and then maybe those will get uh, ported back to uh, uh, other fields. Um, so the, the cross-cutting interdisciplinary nature of this is also, we're, we're basically developing tools uh, to solve problems in our field, uh, but those problems may be uh, common to other fields too. Yeah, so that's happening too. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, you know, in general, the field is very open. And you can literally, I've done this, you can literally take uh, some, some ML paper. They have a GitHub. You clone the GitHub, and you run it. And then you, you know, switch out the data. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite open. <laughs> yeah. I think um, some, of, some of it is closed, but, you know, it, it depends. Yeah. So I think some of the things that maybe are being developed um, for really, you know, direct commercial applications. Those are like, I, I think the GPT-3 natural language processing is not open, as far as I know. So there, there are some examples of closed things. Yeah, but there's a lot of stuff out there that you can find that's open. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Oh, OK, good question. Yes, what is our edge? Um, specifically applying these methods to our field. Well, our edge is our domain knowledge. So the computer scientist knows this and that about uh, machine learning, but they don't know physics. So for them, we, we take it for granted. But for them, everything uh, physics-wise would be a, 
a tough hill to climb. You know, what is the invariant mass of a jet? What is a jet? So, um, you know, so, so yeah, so I think we have domain, domain knowledge that, you know, it, it's easier, I think, for us to pick up some of these techniques than, than the other way around. Um, yeah. We know calculus. That's, uh, <laughs> that's also an advantage. And uh, linear algebra. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? OK. Let me leave this. Uh, well, OK. I'm half joking, but well, I'm not going to have time to cover it in these lectures. But you'll you'll see there's a classic thing in um, neural networks called backpropagation, which was a big discovery, uh, and it's just the chain rule. Uh, <laughs> but it was a big discovery. Okay, it's probably not good that these are being recorded. Uh, okay. Good, so let's see, how am I doing on time? All right. Yeah, okay. So what is machine learning? Okay, so what is machine learning? I think in a nutshell, machine learning is really glorified Curve fitting. Okay, that's all it is. Okay, glorified, but glorified, very glorified. So like super turbocharged curve fitting. So you might be used to thinking of curve fitting as, you know, I have an X and I have a Y and I wanna fit some function to that. So machine learning, well, I should say, Modern machine learning takes this uh, much farther than that. So x here might be, you know, hundred or thousands dimensional. Y might also be similarly dimensioned, or in some sense not even exist. So that would be um, like a unsupervised learning. So this is uh, many dimensional and uh, large number of instances, so large and highly featured uh, data sets, um, and with sort of complex, um, sort of uh, more subtle uh, targets that you're fitting to. Okay, but at the end of the day, that's what we're doing is, oh, and um, we're fitting this with extremely expressive curves functions, let's say. So it's not just some simple polynomial fit, it's, it's a neural network, okay, which, um, which are, are extremely expressive uh, functions. Um, but yeah, so the goal of all this is to learn and extract uh, information from data. So the data is telling a story, um, and using modern machine learning, we can uh, hear that story. We can reconstruct that story. The data has secrets, and uh, using these techniques, we can peer behind the veil and uh, learn about these secrets. OK, so, so the setup is basically uh, we have data, so here I'll call it xi, and it lives in some uh, dimensionality of feature space. So i runs from 1 to n data, so that's the number of instances uh, in the data. So in case that's too abstract, just think of it as number of events at the LHC. Okay, usually, so we generally assume, so for example, 
events at LHC, okay? Um, or in the real life applications, images of cats and dogs, okay? Um, and so generally, there might be exceptions, but I don't think any of them will be in my talk, uh, in these lectures. So generally, we take these uh, instances to be IID. Okay, so each instance of the data is statistically independent from each other one. Um, okay, and so D here uh, is the dimensionality. So this is some vector, a D-dimensional vector, and these are the features. Okay, so um, at the LHC, that might be, you know, PT of the first jet, eta. First, you've all had lectures on collider physics from Heather, right? Okay. So phi of the first jet, et cetera. Uh, or they might be um, pixels um, in an image. Okay, and you can see that very quickly, right? How, how, what are the resolutions of images that we take with our phone? I don't even know anymore. It's like megapixels at least, right? So the D here could be a million dimensional. Um, and the number of events at the LHC, that's, I don't know, billions, trillions. So that's the, the size of the data sets that we're talking about here. Um, okay, so, and we wanna fit a function to this, to do to do to do accomplish some uh, task. Can you see that? Oh, okay. It's the the eraser is kind of a. Okay. All right. So what function? Um, sorry. Yeah. So what are the kind of things we would like to do? So we want to fit a function to fit a function f of x uh, to the data. And theta here are the parameters of the function, which for a typical neural network could easily uh, be in the tens of thousands or even millions or tens of millions. I think the state of the art uh, natural language processing uh, from, is it Google or OpenAI has, um, I think, billions of parameters. So, okay. Um, good, so we wanna fit a function to the data and the way we always do this in uh, ML is to minimize some loss or objective, these are just names for the same thing, function. Or really, really I guess it's more like a functional uh, because it, it takes this function and the data uh, as input. Okay, so the loss is sort of a fundamental object and it's up to you, the, the user, uh, to specify uh, what that loss is depending on what you want to do. Um, so this loss is a function of the parameters, and generally we imagine that we sum over the data, we treat every instance um, equally, but we don't have to, we could weight this in various ways, uh, but just for simplicity. So we, we sum over all the data, and we have some, I guess, loss function that acts on each uh, instance uh, separately. Okay. And so we want to minimize this with respect to uh, the parameters. Yes? Uh, can the optimal loss function itself be learned? Can the optimal loss function itself be learned? Um, it seems... Uh, I have not seen examples of that. Um, it seems like you would need to specify something somewhere to, yeah. Um, so, but maybe there's some, some spirit in which uh, your question is true. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, maximum likelihood estimation, 
Um, and in some sense, yeah, I guess the answer to your question is um, there is always, uh, based on maximal likelihood principle, there is always an optimal loss function, if only we, we could know the likelihood. So in some sense, the likelihood can be learned. Um, and then that, in that case, the optimal loss can be learned. Yeah, that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Yeah. OK. Each data set is independent. So is it OK to have a different function for, a, say, independent data? Uh, yeah, um, that's generally what one does because every data point is independent and sort of democratic, like equ equally valid. Um, so having different Ls for different data points would be, so the, the, what you might see is you might weight different data points differently. You might apply some weight here. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so let me give an example. So for example, Maybe your goal, uh, you want to learn some pre-specified labels, uh, yi. So if yi is continuous, this is called regression. And probably the thing you're most familiar with in terms of curve fitting. Uh, and if yi is discrete, like 0 or 1, um, this is called classification. OK. So the simplest case of the, or it's also called, I think, uh, logistic regression. So the simplest case is binary classification, where the labels are just zero and one. Okay, think of cats versus dogs, or uh, the example we'll cover in next lecture will be tops, top jets versus QCD jets. Um, so for example, yi equals zero or one, that's binary classification. And here, you know, uh, visually, the problem is, ooh, let me use ch colored chalk. So maybe I have class zero data points living here and uh, class one data points living here, okay? And they overlap, which you know, means the classification problem is uh, non-trivial. So what's the optimal way to separate events into class zero and class one you know, when they're not actually separable strictly speaking, uh, in the space, um, that's, that's a very uh, classic um, machine learning problem of binary classification. Um, OK, and good. So in these two cases where we have labels, um, this, these are examples of uh, supervised ML. OK, and typically in, um, uh, high energy physics, so in high energy physics, or probably any field that has sort of messy, noisy data that came from an experiment, right? So in high energy physics and many other fields, uh, truly supervised uh, machine learning is, is done with simulations with truth labels. So supervised ML is simulation-based ML. Um, think of, you know, if I'm doing tops versus QCD, I have to, in the real data, I don't know if an event is top or QCD. They don't come with uh, labels out of the detector, detector unfortunately. But uh, with a simulation, I know what I simulated, right? So then I can, I can define these labels uh, with the, with the truth uh, level uh, information. OK, good. So that's um, binary class. Oh, right. And what is the loss function we could do for this kind of supervised ML? Um, so here's an example of a loss function. So you could have 
f, L of f. It'll also depend then on the label. Um, you could, for instance, do the simplest thing. Okay, so you could say, I want to penalize my uh, function when the, uh, when the output of the function, so I want my function to learn the label as best it can, and I'll penalize the function um, when, when, when it's far away from the, the known label. Okay, so this is called uh, mean squared error. And I'm sure you've all used that before, doing least squares uh, fitting. Okay, uh, it turns out actually, as we'll explain shortly, this is not the optimal loss function for binary classification, and there's a better one you can use. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Okay, so uh, if I talked about supervised ML is one possibility, then you've probably guessed that there is another possibility that's machine learning um, without labels or with incomplete or partial or noisy labels. And um, so that all goes by, uh, well, at least in our field, I don't know how common this is, but you can do less than supervised. ML, um, and so let's say you have no labels at all, so no labels. That's you know fully data driven, right? Sounds really nice if you can achieve it, right? You don't need any simulations. It's literally just getting stuff straight out of the data. So this is unsupervised machine learning. Okay, um, maybe. You, uh, this could still be data driven fully, but maybe you have noisy labels. So for example, maybe I can separate my data into events that uh, are top-like and then not top-like. So the events that are top-like are mostly tops, but they have some background contamination and vice versa. So those could give me uh, noisy labels. So they're not perfect truth level labels, but they're correlated somehow with the truth. So then this is called uh, weakly supervised. And um, the th a third possibility is you might have uh, partial labels. So maybe you mix simulation and data. So some of your events have truth labels and others are unlabeled. Uh, and so this goes by the name of semi-supervised. Okay, so I won't have too much to say about this case here, but uh, I will be talking a lot about examples of these two, unsupervised and weakly supervised, as well as the uh, fully supervised case. Uh, yeah? Uh, since you will be talking about the semi-supervised much, is the general idea that you train a network with the labeled data and then you run the unlabeled data through it? Mm. Yeah. The, uh, Basically, yeah. So you, it's like a way of augmenting. Um, yeah, you can uh, design clever ways to get information out of the uh, unlabeled data. Um, and then you, you, yeah, so you can learn something about the underlying distribution of the data, even from the unlabeled data. And you can use the labels to uh, like sort of pinpoint or narrow it down. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions? All right. So, um, good. So some examples of less than supervised ML that I'll be talking about uh, in these lectures. Um, so one of them is anomaly detection. That's where uh, there's, there's different kinds of anomaly detection. But maybe I have the bulk of my data lives here. And um, and then there's a couple of points like this, or like this, like this. Okay, 
So if somebody handed you this data in two dimensions, you could see by eye, these are clearly outliers, right? So uh, you can train a machine to do that in a much higher dimensional space, um, and that would be outlier detection. Detec detection. And you know, why are we interested in that? Obviously, like those, those could, that could be new physics, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so outlier detection, or out of sample uh, anomaly detection, that's one kind. Uh, another kind of uh, anomaly detection, <clears throat> by the way, this is by far the, here's a place where uh, the, the real world applications in high energy physics have a mismatch, interesting uh, mismatch. You know, so most of the, uh, the literature on anomaly detection in co computer science or ML literature is focused on outlier detection. Um, because, you know, they want to know if you're driving a self-driving car and there's an elephant on the road, maybe the car should stop, you know? So, uh, so that's outlier detection. Um, and actually what we're typically interested in in high energy physics, if in the context, say, of new physics, uh, is not usually that, but it's something like this, right? So, I mean, basically there's, um, there's, Every, everything that's allowed by, uh, every, every point in phase space uh, has some non-zero probability attached to it, let's say, at the LHC, apart from violation of symmetries. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so what we're looking for usually has background around it, and we're looking for uh, an excess of, event, of events over background. And the background is not zero, yeah. So what this is, is not outlier detection, but it's, over densities, or in the ML literature, when it is studied, it's called group or collective anomalies. So I think the example I've seen it given, like in, in on the internet, is uh, you know this is like if you uh, you might want to detect the presence of an unusual animal uh, at at the, at the watering hole, whereas this is you might want to de detect an excess, like an unusual number of animals uh, at the watering hole. Okay, so good. So there are many applications of this, as you might imagine, to new physics searches, uh, triggering, uh, detector monitoring, um, that, yeah, I'll be talking a bit about that. Okay, so another example of unsupervised ML, which is closely tied uh, well, to both of those, I guess, uh, which I think is very cool. And personally, I've done uh, a lot of work with this class of uh, models, is um, suppose somebody hands me the data, then I can learn the P of X that the data was drawn from. I can learn the underlying probability density of the data. Any uh, models, uh, any sort of, I'm not assuming it's Gaussian or anything. So, so I can just directly from the data uh, learn the probability density uh, that it was drawn from. Um, and so yeah, I'll be talking a lot about that in the uh, third lecture. Um, and yeah, so there are applications of this, obviously, to new physics searches. Uh, in a recent paper we showed with uh, my colleagues at Rutgers, uh, we showed how you could learn the phase space density of tracer stars in the Gaia data using this, and then solve the Boltzmann equation directly to get the mass density of the universe. Oh, sorry, not the mass density of the galaxy, um, or the gravitational potential of the galaxy. Um, okay, so that's, this is called density estimation. Um, good, and then finally, Another thing you can do with this is um, you can learn P of X possibly implicitly, maybe. Uh, you can learn P of X implicitly and then um, sample from it. So if someone hands me a, a set of examples, I can learn the distribution those examples were drawn from, and then I can sample from them. And so this is called uh, 
generative modeling. And you may have seen examples of this before uh, in real world where people will generate, say, celebrity faces uh, or fake faces and then ask you to choose is this real or fake. Uh, and, and the methods are so good that uh, people can't tell the difference between real and fake uh, images anymore. And so that's using this uh, technology. Yes? So, uh, generative modeling is just the density estimation with an extra step, right? That's right. So um, that's where the implicitly comes from. So there are more approaches to generative modeling besides density estimation, um, where you only learn this implicitly and you don't have access to P of X itself. So if somebody hands me the data point, I wouldn't be able to tell them what P of X is. Uh, that, so that's, in fact, that's the idea behind generative adversarial networks, um, is they only learn this P of X implicitly. Conversely, uh, there are density estimation methods which are slow to sample from. So you can learn P of X, but you can't sample from it. Uh, so yeah, they're not exactly the same thing, but they are closely related, yeah. Another question? Yeah. That's right. So, um, well, when we talk about GANs, I think I'll be able to answer that in more detail. But yeah, so basically it can, be, it can be fit to the data without ever learning this function explicitly. It can sort of generate from trial functions, um, which are not one-to-one uh, -one with the data, let's say. So it can generate from a latent space that's smaller than the actual data. And it can get penalized for not generating good enough examples. Okay, yeah, another question. Uh, can you provide Do you mean um, instances, like data instances? Not experiments, right? I mean, like, like, I mean for example, product Ah. Uh, yeah, so generally, no. I mean, so that's the limitation of. Uh, machine learning, I think, is it's very good at interpolating, uh, so you can learn what there is to learn from the known data, but then it's not learning any fundamental principles, right? So it can't, it generally doesn't do very well at extrapolating. Uh, the, the best that uh, maybe I've seen is the idea of transfer learning, where you might train it fully on proton-proton scattering. You get a pre-train, what's called a pre-train network, uh, and then you could try to adjust the weights in a small amount in the, in the new setting. But you still need the, the new data to, to fit it to. Otherwise, uh, just, just extrapolating it is probably dangerous. Yeah. Good. OK. So right. So OK. So the last thing I want to say about for now about the lesson supervised approaches is that the, and I think um, there was the, the question previously uh, hinted at this, is that the loss terms or objective functions for these approaches are not as clear cut as uh, you know if you're doing supervised ML. So uh, there's, there's this, these methods uh, to develop them uh, generally require a, a bit more cleverness um, and are a bit more subtle. So that's, uh, that's just something to keep in mind. OK. But, um, but the route to developing all these uh, loss functions, there's a common underlying uh, principle for that, which is the uh, maximum likelihood principle. OK, so all the unsupervised uh, methods and the supervised one, they have a common origin in the idea of uh, maximum likelihood. OK, so. Max, uh, maximum likelihood. So this is a little bit of um, statistics background. And I'm not a Bayesian, so perhaps a Bayesian person would have a different way of saying this. But anyway, um, OK, so this is maximum likelihood estimation, MLE. And the idea is that um, no matter what you're doing, the best thing you can do is to maximize, maximize 
the likelihood, well, let me just write it, that maximize the likelihood of the data given the model. Okay, no matter what you're doing. Um, so usually, as we said, the data is IID XN, right? And so uh, this big probability factorizes to a product of the prob probability under each instance. Okay? And um, what we'll do then is it's natural to take the log of this um, and minus the log. So then we want to minimize the negative log likelihood. So call that thing L is minus log P data given the model, which I ran out of space. Right there here. So we want to minimize uh, so we want to minimize this thing, minus log PXI given the data. Yes? Why do you say it's natural to take log? Oh, well, uh, I guess sums are better than products. Um, and the product of many, many numerically, remember we're doing all these on computers that have finite precision and all that. So numerically, this can quickly lead, you know, if I have a billion data instances, this can quickly lead to an underflow, um, zero, zero basically. But the log is, is more stable, yeah. Okay, good. So MLE, uh, if you take a stats course, they prove all sorts of theorems about it, um, which I'm not gonna go into uh, due to lack of time, but uh, MLE, lots of nice, Properties uh, in the limit of with large data. So the limit of um, infinite data, uh, or just large data, asymptotically, maximum likelihood estimation uh, behaves best. Yes? That's right. Um, no, no, so, uh, so the, 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 yeah, good. So the principle of MLE doesn't require the assumption that the data is IID. I think it's a general principle. It's this step here where I can factorize it into the product of all these different Ps. Uh, that's the step that um, assumes it's IID. And if you like, that's a for simplicity step. In real life, there could be correlations among them, and then we know how to handle those with, uh, you know, covariance matrices and things like that. Um, so, yeah. So, so I'll just assume that they're IID. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, yes? Why would we not, this seems almost entropic in nature, why would we not multiply this by the probability of each event point so that we could have a maximum likelihood in terms of an entropy? Multiply it by the probability, multiply it where? The whole P thing? Or? Oh, P log P. Ah, good. So that's a good question. So in actually, I am multiplying it. So okay, here's another general stats trick um, where okay. So this is called a what is this thing called? A sample estimate of an underlying thing, which is actually an integral. So here I'm sampling from the data and instances, and so this is a discretized or finite sampling estimator for the following object. Okay, so when I take samples, I, I get that. Uh, so actually, it is the entropy exactly as you were uh, saying. Yeah. Okay, good. So let me give one example which we will want to use, um, which is, again, binary classification. Yeah, so let's use the maximum likelihood principle to derive uh, 
the correct loss function for binary classification. Okay. Loss for binary classification. Okay. Um, good. So what is it we want our model to do? Uh, we actually want it to be a probabilistic model. Okay. So we instead of saying that we want this to be exactly, did I just erase the, oh no, good. Okay, so we're never going to get a model that can say exactly that this is class 0 or class 1 if the two sets overlap. The best we could hope for is a function that can give us the probability that x is class 1. And we're assuming that all the data is either class 1 or class 0. So if it's not class 1, it's class 0. So the probability that it's class 0 is just 1 minus this. Okay, so 1 minus this is the probability that it's class 0. Okay, so now what's the probability of our data given this model? Okay, so this is our model of the data. And, you know, if we just chose the parameters and the function at random, it would not be a very good model. Uh, so we want to fit this model to the data. And so what's the probability of the data given the model? Okay. It's, oh, right, so what's our data? Let's say our data is, um, I have some instances of class one, and I have some instances of class zero. Okay, so let's say that's our data. Uh, and so then the probability of the data given the model looks like this. So it's just the probability of all the class one guys uh, under F, right? And then the probability of all the class zero guys under 1 minus f. Okay? Um, good. So now if I take the negative log of this, I get the following equals the sum Okay, and I can write this more compactly uh, using these truth labels. Okay, I can write this more compactly using the truth labels like the following. So L is equal to minus the sum over the data, y i log f of x i uh, plus one minus y i log one minus f. Sorry, I wrote in the corner. Um, somebody told me not to do that. Okay, plus Okay, so that's how I could write it just as a sum over all the data using the truth labels. And so this is called, this has a name. This is called binary cross entropy. And this is the uh, ideal or best loss to use for binary classification. You can see it's not the same thing as mean squared error. And in fact, you can play around with it. I recommend it. If you use mean squared error to do binary classification, you will get a biased, in general, a biased or suboptimal uh, result compared to this. Yeah? Uh, is that a proven statement that that is the optimal loss function? I guess based on this MLE, in some asymptotic thing with stats theorems, yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are, what is like the parameters there that you're looking for? 
they are the things I'm going to fit for. So this is a function of theta. And we're just setting up the problem, and then we're going to minimize this with respect to theta. Then we've got our binary classifier. Yeah. OK. Good. OK, so let me just um, expand on this uh, a little bit more. Um, so actually, yeah, so what would be the, let's say we did this. And let's say we had a it, like arbitrarily expressive function. What is the optimal classifier we could learn? So just a little bit more uh, stats uh, background, I guess. Um, so what is the optimal classifier that we could learn? So, and actually, it's good that somebody asked me about this earlier. I'm going to, to do that, I'm going to do a little bit of calculus of variations with, um, with the uh, continuous version of this, the integral form of this. So what is the what is the optimal classifier? Um, okay, so oops. All right. So what this is to, to get that I have to I would like to minimize this with respect to the function f. Yeah, just like we do when we get the equations of motion for a Lagrangian. Um, and so to do that, I have to go to the continuous form of this, where instead of a sum over class one uh, and class zero, I have instead an integral. And so all the data in uh, class one has some distribution to it. Let's say that's P1 of x. And all the data in class zero has another distribution to it, P0 of x. And so I can. That is the sampling uh, estimator for the following. Um, let me just get rid of the theta, okay? So f of x plus p0 of x log 1 minus f of x. Okay, so it's really like a Lagrangian, right? And so if I minimize this um, with respect to f of x, the function f of x, then I quickly find that, so delta L is equal to P1 of x over f of x minus P0 of x over 1 minus f of x. So if I set this to 0 and solve for f of x, I get that f of x, and I'll write this with a theta hat to indicate that I've solved for the optimal uh, parameters, assuming my function, you know, covers this possibility, which is just this. So this is the optimal classifier. How come we need to do all this machine learning? What if I have a formula for the optimal classifier? Yes. That's right, and this is different. This is the uh, probability density of all the class one things in the feature space. So it's different. Why do I need to do all this machine learning though if I have if I have a formula for the optimal classifier? Yeah. Because we don't have infinitely many data points. We don't have infinitely many data points, but because we don't have infinitely many data points, we cannot learn these things, these probability densities. We don't know what they are in general. So that's what the machine learning is for. Um, good. So, and the last thing I'll say, what time? Okay, yeah, but probably the last thing I'll say um, is that this has, I can rewrite this as um, r of x over 1 plus r of x, where r of x is p1 of x over p0 of x. So this is called the likelihood ratio. Okay, and this function is monotonic with the likelihood ratio. So, uh, let me write it like this, R and F. So R goes from minus infinity to 
uh, sorry, sorry, it goes from 0 to infinity, OK? And f goes from 0 to 1. So if you plot it, it, it looks like this. OK, so it's monotonic. f is monotonic with r. So that means that this classifier score is just as good as this classifier score. OK, they're equivalent. No additional power. Um, and so this is saying that the optimal classifier is the likelihood ratio. And this is a very famous result in statistics. This is called the Neyman Pearson lemma. I think it goes back to 1930 something. Okay, it says the optimal classifier is the likelihood ratio. Okay, and later we'll see um, in various examples how you can turn this around. It's something called the likelihood ratio trick. You can use a classifier to learn the likelihood ratio. You're not actually interested in the score, the classifier task itself, but you can train a classifier to learn the likelihood ratio and then use that likelihood ratio for other purposes like density, like finding over densities in the data. Yeah. Yes. No, no, this is just a func this is just plotting r uh, f versus r. So forget about the x. Okay. It's just if if I view f and r is like a a change a, um, like a change of variables. Yeah. So one function is just related to the other in a simple way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a simple way to see the bias for the uh, MSE? Yeah, good question. Um, so you mean if I had done the same exercise with MSE? Yeah. Not so trivial, maybe, because I'd have to think about how to write that in the sampling form. Oh, I guess I could. Yeah, I would write f minus 1 integrated over p1, and then f. Yeah, I would get a different, I would get a, well, yeah, so the short answer is I could, good homework exercise. Yes. <laughs> you, you could do the same exercise and get a different classifier score, which would not be this. And yeah, you should not view this as a proof of the Neyman Pearson lemma. The real proof of the Neyman Pearson lemma comes uh, independently of this derivation. Uh, and so just by getting a different classifier score that's not the likelihood ratio, you would learn that you have not gotten the optimal classifier using MSC. Yeah. Good. OK. Well, I have five more minutes. That's good. Well, um, OK. So in the last, are there any other questions? Yes. To do this step here, uh, yes, I have made that assumption. Um, if I wanted to have discrete data, well, yeah, I guess, yeah, I've assumed that it's continuous here, which, yeah. I think you could, you could run a similar argument for discrete data, which would probably be uh, simpler um, in some sense, but, uh, but yeah, okay. Another question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Call this the entropy. Um, why? Maybe this is obvious, but why is that entropy? I think that's uh, the. So this is like in, this is like an information theoretic version of uh, entropy. If you do statmec, uh, you have a similar formula um, using the whatever the Boltzmann distribution. You have a similar formula for entropy. So it just has the same functional form as like entropy from statmec. Yeah. So so there's a lot. There's a huge uh, analogy or almost like isomorphism between statmec and information theory. So, um, so yeah, I think it's more than just an analogy. Yeah, yeah. OK, so I have a few more minutes. So let me just say a few more things about, um, let's see, where's the best place to put this? Good, OK, so, so I've explained to you how you would construct the best uh, loss function. I've given an example of that um, for binary classification. And I've shown you how if I had the most expressive possible function such that I could do this uh, calculus of variations, I could get the optimal uh, answer out. OK, so now where do neural networks come in? Um, neural networks come in because they provide an ex extremely expressive family of fitting functions. OK, so, so, so then um, in some sense, they're like uh, discretizing function space. Okay, and so they essentially allow me to approach this optimal answer uh, because they're so expressive. 
Okay. And um, so they're, they're sort of an upgrade from, say, polynomial, fitting this to polynomials or pick your favorite functional, like Dirichlet functions, whatever. You don't have to do any of that. You just write down a neural network. And with its many, many parameters and the sophisticated ways of uh, fitting them to the data, um, then you can get something approaching the optimal uh, answer. OK, so um, and that's what's been appreciated, I guess, in the modern machine learning revolution um, since you know 2010 or so, is that deep neural networks uh, are expressive and flexible, and so they can be used for many, many different tasks. Okay, so now, so, so neural networks are, you should think of them as a family of fitting functions. So now these are the weights of the neural network, weights and biases uh, of the neural network. Um, and it's been sort of discovered um, in the past decade or so uh, is that these are, well, it's been known for a long time, I think, that these are extremely expressive. And there's something called the uh, universal approximation theorem, which unfortunately I can't uh, do any justice to here, but you can look it up. Um, there's an amazing amount of stuff on Wikipedia. Um, so you can look this up. And basically, it amounts to proving that you can fit with a neural network that has sufficient capacity, you can fit this function. If you could prove that you could fit this function, you can fit any function. Um, OK, so that's the universal approximation theorem. Um, and these turn out to scale, scale well to um, large dimensions and data sets. And, um, and I would say that, yeah, I would say, I think it's not an exaggeration or mischaracterization to say that they generalize uh, unreasonably well beyond the training data. Not, not in the form of uh, extrapolation that we talked about before, but in the form of interpolation. So if, the, if you have a new data set which is drawn from the same distribution as the training data, neural networks are seen empirically to generalize unreasonably well uh, beyond, uh, to, to this new data. Okay, and it's, it's unreasonably because this is something um, the ML theorists are uh, tr still trying to prove uh, is, is why neural networks uh, generalize so well. Okay, so this is... This is why the rest of the lectures are going to be um, about neural networks and not about other uh, machine learning methods. Okay, and with that, I'm, I'm out of time. Thanks. <laughs>